Hello, I'm Daryl Anderson. In this, the first ground cover TV supplement for 2013, we're going to look at emerging pests, diseases and weeds. We're not talking about things previously undiscovered, but rather the emergence of concerning developments such as the spread of herbicide resistant weeds and red-legged earth mites developing resistance to insecticides. But to start with, we're going to look at the emergence of fungicide resistance and to begin with an update of a story we reported last year, fungicide resistance in barley powdery mildew. This is a model of CYP51, a protein found in the pathogen that causes the fungal disease barley powdery mildew. What makes this particular fungal protein very significant is that if a strain of barley powdery mildew is to become resistant to a fungicide, it most likely will be because of a mutation in this gene. Fungicides that used to be successful at controlling barley powdery mildew, particularly tepuconazole and, tri and triademinol, are now failing to control. Professor Oliver's team has been taking isolates from field samples of the fungus and exposing them to the various fungicides at different concentrations. Resistant isolates have their DNA sequenced and cross-checked against mutations known to have resistance to the DMI, also known as the triazole group Since of that story was produced in September 2012, Richard Oliver's Western Australian-based team has been able to expand on its work. Isolates of the powdery mildew pathogen from Eastern Australia have been compared to the mutant mildew found in the West. And that's where Richard picks up the story. What we found is that isolates of the pathogen from WA are, have a different mutation from ones from South Australia and from Victoria, Tasmania and South, New South Wales. Those isolates from Eastern Australia do not have this new mutation, which means that they are still uh, susceptible, still well controlled by products with tebuconazole in them, for example. But we would also say that, that the, the, the WA experience has shown that that's a risky situation. Risky, according to Professor Oliver, because the continued exposure to this particular group of fungicides will eventually lead to the building of resistance in eastern Australia. Rotating the tebuconazole group with other fungicides, using mixtures and applying the lowest recommended rates will instead prolong their usefulness. The research goes on. So this is where botrytis has affected the chickpea pod. Jenny Davidson is another scientist studying fungal pathogens. There are millions and millions of spores out there in the crops. We're collecting hundreds, so we're only collecting a very small sample of what's out there. And of those hundreds over 10 years, we've found one that is resistant. So it, it is a very small number at this stage that is resistant, but if the pressure is put on that population and lots and lots of fungicide is put out, it will mean that that resistant type will have an opportunity to multiply up. That one isolate of Botrytis cinerea, which was resistant to carbendism and found in a South Australian chickpea crop, was enough to flag a warning about the emergence of fungicide resistance. And to avoid that possibility, pulse growers have been advised to strictly follow chemical label application rates. The first thing growers should be doing is reading the label recommendations and understanding the regulations as to how many sprays of a particular ingredient that they can put out on a crop. And with things like carbendism and prosimidone, it is only two sprays that they can put in a particular crop. So if they stick to that, then they, can under they will be able to control or reduce the level of um, fungicide resistance building up in their crops. Jenny Davidson is also researching the timing of spray applications and says growers of any pulse crop need to be very strategic about when they put out fungicide sprays. The first spray that goes out is before you even see the disease. We time that with crop growth stage. We know when the canopy closes over is the last opportunity to get fungicide down to the base of the plants. So we say to our growers, for faba beans and lentils in particular, always put out a fungicide spray at that point. So we have done a lot of effort to work out what is the best time to put out the sprays to get the maximum return and the maximum control of the disease. So that whole epidemiology and understanding how the disease works, how it performs under different weather conditions has been very crucial to getting those fungicide strategies understood. Botrytis is a fungus that can survive long term in the soil or on plant litter as sclerotes, non-fruiting structures. 
Under warm, wet conditions, the fungus activates and spores can spread rapidly, making crop monitoring an essential management strategy, according to Jenny Davidson. It will infect the flowers and they will rot and fall off. And of course, that means then there's no pods and no grain for the farmer to harvest. In faba beans and lentils, it also attacks the stems so that the whole plant will fall over and then the whole plant dies. So obviously then you get no um, grain from those plants that die off. And it can move very rapidly across a paddock. You'll see big patches dying out very, very quickly. So you can understand from a grower's perspective why they want to get those fungicides out and why they're really keen to make sure that this disease is under control. But in terms of getting their fungicides out, um, they have to get them out early before the disease has spread. Because once it started spreading, they come in behind with a fungicide, they're not going to get the control they want, so they put out another fungicide, and it may well be they keep putting out fungicides. That means then you're putting the pathogen under pressure, and that's when you start running into potential resistance, fungicide resistant problems. In the lab, it's divide and multiply to build pathogen numbers. In the field, nature can do the job even faster and on a large scale. A lot of the diseases we work with are windborne. They're spread around by the wind. The spores are produced by the fungi and then blown very long distance. So we're setting up some research where we have spore traps that um, suck the wind in and then they capture the spores on sticky tape. Then we assess the spores using our DNA um, lab here. It can quantify how many spores of different fungi are sitting on those tapes. So we set them up in different places around the state. We're looking at the impact of um, different weather conditions, whether it's rainfall, temperature, humidity, wind and all these sorts of things, and the impact that has on the spore dispersal and just where these different fungal spores are spreading around. Understanding the climate's impact, as well as a pathogen's development, makes it possible to give growers even more strategies to reduce the risk of fungicide resistance emerging. Because we know so much about the epidemiology of black spot, we know when the spores, those airborne spores, are being released from last year's stubble. And so we monitor that, and in many years those spores are released before the crop comes out of the ground. So the farmers can change their sowing date according to the timing of that spore release. Effectively, then they can um, eliminate the risk of, of black spot in their field piece. Black spot is Ascochyta blight, and North America's experience of this particular fungal pathogen provides another example of what not to do. They've been using the strobilurins quite a lot, and um, our understanding is that they've put out many, many strobilurin applications in chickpeas. And as a result, they're now finding that those strobilurins will not control the ascochyta in chickpeas. So that's another warning sign for our industry because we're starting to move towards registration of these particular fungicides in our pulse crops. And we need to be aware that we have to use them properly so that they can remain effective over a long period of time. So how important is it to protect the efficacy of the fungicides that are in use? It's very important because we aren't sure just how many of these actives are going to be available to the industry in the future. There are a whole suite of different fungicides in the world, but these are becoming more and more restricted in their use, particularly in the European Union. And quite often uh, we do follow the world regulations in that area, so we may find that less and less fungicides become available to the industry. So we need to protect what we've got. When specialist farm consultant Jim Orson was in Australia last year to speak at GRDC Advisor Updates, he highlighted the concern in the UK over the European Union's regulations on farm chemical use. So we don't know yet the real impact of some of this regulation in terms of pesticide availability, but estimates have been done and it could mean that we'll lose a lot of useful pesticides uh, to broadacre cropping. There's a list of 22 or 26, depending on what standard you look at, some of which can tr uh, have um, important um, herbicides for grass weed control, pendomethylene, um, and also, more critically, very valuable fungicides. We use a lot of fungicides in Europe. We have 
a lot of fungal attack in, in cereals. They create huge yield increases or prevent huge yield losses uh, and some of those are actually on this list of which could be at risk. So we do, we do really worry about that. Back here in Australia, the outlook is positive. To support growers in managing future fungicide resistance risks, GRDC has invested in the Australian Centre for Nectrophic Fungal Pathogens at WA's Curtin University and supports projects undertaken by independent research company Calix Australia and applied research organisation FAR Australia, the Foundation for Arable Research. Via these research providers, GRDC is also working in partnership with chemical manufacturers to deliver new fungicides with modes of action suitable for use in cereals and pulses, while also protecting the usefulness of current fungicides. Next in our special report, we look at a different area of emerging resistance. Jane Drinkwater takes up the story. The problem of glyphosate resistant summer grasses is becoming one of the most pressing issues that growers currently face. Australia currently has three species of summer grass confirmed as glyphosate resistant. Liverseed grass, windmill grass and ornless barnyard grass. Recently there's been a survey conducted just on barnyard grass and it showed that out of approximately 80 samples collected randomly across the region, 60% of those were glyphosate resistant. In the sample, which covered Dolby to Tamworth, resistance was found from Gundawindi to Narrabri. Since the first case of barnyard grass resistance was discovered in 2007, there's been a steady increase. The thought of glyphosate losing its effectiveness is a scary prospect for growers. Once they have glyphosate resistance, they can no longer use this product that they've relied on for many years. And glyphosate's such an effective product, it's cheap, it's safe and it's convenient. It's so essential to weed control that there's a national body whose focus is to prolong the herbicide's working life. Glyphosate is our most important herbicide. If you actually look at where it's used around the farm, it's used in many, many places. If we lose glyphosate for important weeds, it's going to greatly increase the cost of weed management. It's the very usefulness of glyphosate that may be leading to its downfall. Because of its cost effectiveness and convenience, there's a danger growers can rely on it too much, particularly for summer fallow control. We've now reached a stage where glyphosate has been relied on for enough years that that pressure on the weed species um, has reached the point where there's a lot of resistance out there. Um, the other reason I guess there's been an increase is we've moved away from conventional tillage systems now to zero till systems. So we're placing a lot heavier reliance on our herbicides in general. We're also seeing changes to how and when weeds grow. The emergence patterns of the summer grasses have changed slightly over the last 10 or 15 years. Um, and it's changed a lot for a lot of our weed species. For example, barnyard grass was once considered a summer weed species. Now we're finding it emerge early in spring and later into autumn as well. So it presents a whole new range of scenarios where we're trying to manage this weed. Michael's working on new strategies to manage summer weeds, including those with glyphosate resistance. We're gaining more information on their emergence patterns, on their seed banks, and on even the speed of growth and seed production. So we're finding out a lot more about the ecology of these weed species. The other thing that we're doing is we're defining and developing tactics for the control of these weed species and packaging them so farmers are able to apply them in combination to achieve the best control they can and to reduce seed production on these weeds. One of the most useful tactics is double knock. We've seen that the double knock is extremely effective on um, pre-tillering or early tillering summer grasses. So this includes um, both windmill grass and barnyard grass, but also the troublesome weed Feathertop Roads grass. Michael hopes to define when the most effective time is to apply a double knock and what interval works best between knocks. The timing of the double knock is critical. A delay of even just one week can reduce your control dramatically. Uh, if you do happen to delay your um, first or second knock, we have found that increasing the rate of herbicide for both of the knocks does improve your control. And when ground cover reported on windmill grass last summer, double knock at the seedling stage was recommended as the most effective control. 
Glyphosate does a, a, an okay job on seedlings, but what we've find, been finding is that a, a double knock strategy where you've got a glyphosate mixture first and you're following that up with a bipyridyl will give you better control of those seedlings. If you find glyphosate isn't working as well on your property as it has in the past, does this mean you have resistant weeds? I guess when you consider herbicide resistance, it's pretty cut and dried. So a species that you once were able to control with a certain herbicide such as glyphosate, you now are not able to control it with that weed. However, there are other environmental constraints that will impact on the efficacy of your herbicides. For example, if you have a stressed weed, uh, the herbicide isn't going to be as, as effective. It's important though, if you're finding that you have poor control of a weed with a herbicide, you need to confirm that through testing. And there are several testing facilities available that can do that for you. And what action can you take if you do find glyphosate resistance? There are a number of different herbicide options available, but with any weed species, the sooner you can get onto the problem, the better. So if you have small, unstressed weeds, uh, you're going to get improved control with most herbicides. When Ground Cover spoke with weed researcher Jeff Worth in 2011, the advice he gave then on glyphosate resistance in barnyard grass still supports the current thinking on rotating chemical use for all summer grasses. There's an opportunity to use another herbicide group or even a residual herbicide or something, do that. So not concentrate on one thing, but just try and be more proactive rather than reactive. For glyphosate effectiveness to continue, growers need to adopt an integrated approach, finding problems early and acting fast to nip them in the bud. Weed management in general relies on diligence. Um, this is especially the case when it comes to glyphosate resistance. Um, it's important to identify problems um, as soon as they become a problem in your paddock, so monitoring is critical. Um, if you don't currently have a glyphosate resistance problem on your property, now is the time to start using alternative tactics. So use different herbicide mode of actions, um, use non-chemical approaches as well. So prevention will ensure that you're able to use glyphosate into the future. If you don't prevent, you will lose this herbicide. In this final part of our special report on emerging pests, diseases and weeds, we look at the red-legged earth mite, a species that arrived from South Africa over a hundred years ago and is now established across the western and southern grain-growing regions of Australia. What's worse is that some populations of this mite in WA have become resistant to one of the major insecticide groups used to control it, and there's a real danger that that resistance could spread to the east coast. While the mites are not so easy to see, being the size of a pinhead, magnified, it's easy to see where the name comes from. Their eight red legs and black body stand out against the bright green of the crops they feed on. Aggregations of the mites suck the life out of the leaf tissue, leaving a silvery surface. In big enough swarms, they can completely destroy the newly emerged plants. Paul Umina has been studying these mites for more than a decade. We do know a fair bit about the movement of red-legged earth mites. Um, we know that the actual mites themselves, when they're actually adults, don't move very far. They only move a matter of sort of 10 to 15 metres within a paddock or within a pasture or, or a crop. However, the, the eggs, uh, particularly the, the eggs that are laid and persist over summer, which are called diapause eggs, we know actually move far greater distances. So to get from one side of the country to the other is a remarkable and alarming achievement. So these eggs um, are very resistant to desiccation and they can actually be blown around on summer winds, um, several hundreds of kilometres. Um, we also suspect that the eggs can actually be transported in um, hay and silage and also caught up in soil and, and moved around in, in, uh, with livestock and or farm machinery. And so, you know, the genetic work that we've done to date has actually shown that we are actually getting movement of red-legged earth mites from Western Australia um, into the East Coast or vice versa. So we're actually getting a mixing of populations across WA and the East Coast of Australia. This is where the red-legged earth mite can be found today. 
They emerge in autumn to attack seedlings of cereals, pulses and oilseed crops. By late spring, adult mites are gone, their eggs left to oversummer on the soil surface. Where the first red-legged earth mites landed in Australia is unknown, but it's believed they probably arrived as oversummering eggs in soil used as ship's ballast. And while they've spread across the country, it's in Western Australia that their presence is being felt most, as Paul Umina explains. On this map, the closed circles uh, actually indicate where we've identified resistance in Western Australia. Resistance was first confirmed around Esperance in 2006. We, it's now known to be quite prevalent in a region northeast of Albany. There's also a, a property or two up here around Boyup Brook, and more recently there has been resistance identified north of Perth, which is not um, identified on this map. So you can see that resistance is actually quite widespread already within Western Australia. We know from the genetic work that the movement of resistant individuals out of WA into other states is a very real possibility and it is in fact something that we probably predict will happen in the near future. Red-legged earth mites are typically found in high densities within paddocks and have been routinely controlled with chemicals for the past 50 years. With that amount of selection pressure over such a long period it was inevitable something would break and fortunately it was only one chemical group. We only have insecticide resistance uh, confirmed in the uh, synthetic pyrethroid chemical group. At this stage we have not identified insecticide resistance to other chemical classes. And this is important because it means farmers still have options to control red-legged earth mites that have developed resistance as long as they're using uh, the right chemicals and they're using them strategically. When synthetic pyrethroid resistant red-legged earth mites from WA were tested against a control group of susceptible mites from Victoria, the results were conclusive. And what's quite clear is that the dose response curve for the mites collected near Esperance is significantly shifted to the right, um, which illustrates and demonstrated to us that we actually had high levels of resistance in these mites. What we also found was when we actually read these mites through a generation in the laboratory and re-screened the tolerance levels of these mites, um, the results which are demonstrated in the graph below show almost a mirror image. And this actually demonstrated that the resistance was actually heritable and would be actually passed on to uh, second and subsequent generations of mites. It's not entirely sure what the mechanism conferring resistance in red-legged earth mites is, although there are some clues. We suspect that it is something called the target site modification, um, and the reason we suspect this is due to the very high levels of resistance that we're actually observing in the field, um, and that would point towards this particular mechanism that is, is responsible for resistance to uh, red-legged earth mites, or in red-legged earth mites, to synthetic pyrethroids. Monitoring the WA situation and establishing a surveillance program across the southern states is one of the priorities for researchers. But there are things growers can do as well. There's something called time right, which is a, a window of opportunity in spring, which, is, uh, which has been developed by CSIRO. And if uh, farmers spray during that window, what they actually do is they uh, significantly uh, reduce the, the population of red-legged earth mites that flow on to the following year. So we get up to 95% reduction in red-legged earth mite population sizes if we get our spring spray correct. Um, and so the following year we actually get a, a vast reduction in the number of mites that are emerging around that same time as the, the crop seedlings are actually getting out of the ground. Red-legged earth mites are not without enemies and the research project is also looking at the impact of shelter belts near crops and even strategic strips of grass to harbour beneficial insects. The key beneficial insects that we have within Australia that feed on red-legged earth mites are primarily other mites, so they're predatory mites. Uh, they're typically a little bit larger than the red-legged earth mite and usually they're quite brightly coloured, um, so usually a sort of a red or orange colour. The other thing growers can do is rotate insecticides and crops. Considering the paddock's cropping history and the crop risk can make a difference. Canola is probably the most vulnerable crop, uh, crop species. So coming out of a pasture paddock, making a decision as to whether you will actually put canola into that paddock or perhaps a more tolerant species such as, such as a cereal or a pulse crop 
is one particular thing to consider. Understanding the genetics and the movement patterns of red-legged earth mites are what Paul Yumana wants to take further. This knowledge will help predict the speed at which resistance will spread to other states. It'll also provide an insight into the likelihood and time frame of resistance developing to other chemical groups besides synthetic pyrethroids. Now, if you'd like even more information about emerging issues with diseases, weeds and pests, be sure to read the supplement which arrived with your January issue of the Ground Cover newspaper, or go online at grdc.com.au. I'm Daryl Anderson. See you soon.